pleasure to present another Sarah, Sarah Woolley um, at McGill University. Sarah did her undergraduate degree at Duke and she did her PhD work at UT Austin. And she is now here, as I said, and she studies songs in zebra finch. And she's particularly interested in studying production and the neural development of male song, but also looking at the females. And she's using a whole bunch of methods, electrophysiology, immunocytochemistry, computational methods, and behavior to study how the females' brains perceive and process these signals. So today, she is going to talk to us about what do female birds like. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Can you hear me? Is that working? I'm so short. Okay. So I think the title that was on my, that's on the webpage for my talk is actually something much drier and more boring, I think, which is neural mechanisms of female preferences or something like that. But really what I want to talk to you about today is what my lab works on. Is that too close? Or? Okay. <laughs> um, is what uh, this sort of a general sense of what my lab works on is, and what we're trying to figure out really is what do female birds like? And why do they like the things that they do? Why do they like one thing and not something else? And so what I'm going to describe to you are um, sort of a number of pieces of data that we have that are sort of fitting together in the puzzle of trying to make sense of what this is. And I'll give you an idea of how it is that we study this. Um, and I'm going to leave open the question of what does it mean for a female bird to like something? And we can come back to that a bit at the end, because that's the part that will play into this idea of cognition and sentience and so on. But I want to give you a lot of data and give you a sense of what it is that we look at. But as I do that, you can think about what that might mean from either a very anthropomorphic standpoint or even from the point of view of a bird, what it means that they're liking these particular things. So I study this in the context of vocal communication. So in vocal communication, you have a signaler who's going to produce some sort of signal, and you have a receiver that takes in that information. And the receiver can use the information for all kinds of things. So they can use it to figure out what species it is that's communicating with them. Is it my species or a different species? They can use that information to identify different individuals. Oh, that must be Fred singing over there, and that's George over to my right. And then they can also use that information to make decisions, in particular decisions about mating, at least when we're talking about uh, songbirds. And so as far as vocal communication, there's a number of different forces we can think of that will influence the vocal communication system. So one of those forces is sort of genetics and evolution. And in particular, um, uh, so this is a picture of a Tungara frog, and in fact, yeah, oh, you can't read it. It's too far at the bottom. Um, tomorrow you'll hear more about Tungara frogs when Mike Ryan gives his talk, Mike Ryan from the University of Texas. But I just want to mention them today because they're one of these really beautiful systems where we can see how evolution has really shaped the signal receiver dynamic. So in particular, in Tungara frogs, Females, males produce calls that look like this. So this is a spectrogram. On the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is frequency, and how dark these elements are indicates their amplitude or their loudness. And so the male produces two different kinds of sounds. He produces a whine, and he produces a chuck. And so females actually, they like the whine just fine, and they can use, they can take information out of it, but they really like this chuck. They like this low-frequency adornment that the male sticks on the end. And it turns out um, that females like that chuck because of the structure of their auditory system. So all frogs have two parts of their cochlea, their inner ear. And um, those evolved under natural selection. All frogs have them. Um, but it turns out that this chuck stimulates a particular part of one of those sections of the inner ear. And so females like chucks just because chucks are really stimulating their auditory system. And so it looks like male vocalizations have exploited a sort of sensory bias that's structurally there in the ear. It's not that females learn to like chucks or that they have to develop in order to like them. It's just the way that their ear is put together, it makes them like the chuck, because it really stimulates that part of their ear. So we can think about sort of genetics and evolution as being one of these things that really shapes the, both the vocal signals that get produced, as well as the perception of those signals. Um, and this sort of thing can lead to inherent biases in perception. So we humans have these inherent biases too. So if you think about the sound of fingernails scraping on a chalkboard, 
it turns out that this is universally disliked. And in fact, you don't have to have heard this sound before to dislike it when you hear it. You don't even have to have interacted with a chalkboard, because these days many people have not because we have whiteboards. But when you hear that sound, everyone in the room will hate it. I'm not going to play the sound because that would be bad for all of us. Um, but this is one of those inherent biases that just seems to be there as a consequence of the way the structure of your auditory system gets put together. So as humans, I, I think a lot of this work on sort of genes and evolution is really is inherently remarkable. But as humans, one of the things that I find most interesting is not the inherent bias that's there, but the plasticity that we can show. And language is a great example of that. And so um, in particular, developmental auditory experience, so the sounds you experience when you're young, will tune up your auditory system to respond in particular ways to different sounds. And then additionally, we know that even as adults, we can still be plastic. So there's a lot of sort of adult social and auditory experience that you can have that will let your brain and your behavior change in different situations. And so I'll be focusing more on these latter two for the rest of the talk. So in particular, thinking about how production and perception of vocalizations gets shaped by what you experience in development, um, and then also thinking about adult plasticity. So we know as adults that it's you're not as plastic as you used to be. You can't sort of just sit in the middle of the room like a sponge and take in information and memorize it and remember it and use it to sort of shape your brain and your behavior. But we can still show some plasticity. And it seems that our adult plasticity depends on how we experience different sounds. So we'll talk a bit about sort of both of these two um, for the rest of the talk. All right, and I'll start with talking a bit about this sort of developmental shaping of your auditory experience. And again, as with the other talks, feel free to cut me off at any point if you have any questions. All right, so language, if we're thinking about humans, language dramatically shapes our auditory perception. So learning to speak is what we call a sensory motor task. What you have to do is you take in those sounds and you memorize them. So you need to hear sounds to learn language. And then you go through a period of motor practice where you produce a lot of sort of babbling noises and you try to match those to the template that you've memorized so that um, eventually you can refine those sounds and produce words. Um, and so, oops, let's go forward here for a second. So here's an example of some early babbling. All right, so I'm proud to say that she has gone on and can now speak in full sentences um, and no longer just makes those sort of babbling noises. But one of the things is that when we watch children learning how to speak, that's the part that really captivates us, right? It's the them sort of making these mimicking sounds. They're very cute. They're, you want to watch how it is that they're doing that. But it turns out that at the same time as they're learning to make these sounds and copy sounds that other individuals are making, they're, they're also sort of refining their perception of different sounds. And in particular, the language that you hear when you're young will dramatically shape the kinds of sounds you can discriminate when you're older. So I'll give you two examples of this. So here's, um, these are going to be two words that are in Mandarin. C. Qi. And I'll play this one more time. Qi. Qi. So those are two different words. And I've listened to this enough times that I can tell them apart, maybe. Um, I don't know if I could do it on the street, but I can do it here today. This one in Hindi, I have a much harder time with. So here's two sounds here. Uh, 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 uh. So those are two different words. I cannot tell them apart. I definitely couldn't do it if you came up to me and said them both to me at the same time. But if anyone here speaks Mandarin or Hindi, those sounds are probably completely different to you. You're like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I can definitely hear that those are two different words. And so depending on what language you heard when you were young, you're sort of refining your auditory system to be able to, to discriminate particular sounds and not discriminate other ones. And so one question we had with songbirds was, well, does that sort of developmental experience, does it make a difference for female birds when they're young? Do they need to hear song or particular songs in order to be able to discriminate things when they're older? 
And so we used a particular song um, in order to ask this question. So we found in the past that male songbirds will adjust their performance for females. In particular, when a male is singing, when a female is present, a male will sing to that female. And so he'll sing what we would call a courtship song or a directed song. And this is just a spectrogram showing you what that song looks like. And I'll play it for you in just a second. Um, but again, it's sort of time on the x-axis, frequency on the y-axis. And he's singing the sort of the darkness is the loudness. And he's repeating these sort of chunks of things, right? You can see that there's a, he sings sort of four or five things here, and he repeats it, and he repeats it, and he repeats it here. So this is when he's singing to a female. So the female's there, and he does a little dance, and he moves around in front of her, and he sings this elaborate courtship song. When he's by himself, and there's no other birds around, he also sings. And he sings what we describe as his alone song, or his undirected song. And the first thing to point out is that it's basically the same song. So he's not singing, you know, song A and song B. He's actually just going to modify his performance of those two things. So again, we see there's these, you know, the same set of repeated chunks is here as here. But it turns out the way that he's singing those is just a little bit different. So to highlight how similar they are, I want to play them both, both for you. So here's the courtship song. It sounds like you're playing with a squeaky toy of some sort. And so that was the courtship song. Here's the alone song. Now, I've studied songbirds for 15 years now, and I can't necessarily tell those two things apart very easily. Um, what he's changing is he sings a slightly longer version of the song when he sings to the female. He sings it a little bit faster, although it's hard for me to detect, um, and most people. And it's more stereotyped. So he's more likely to sing, um, if he's tr aiming for a particular pitch of A, he, he won't be flat or sharp when he's singing to a female. He'll just hit A. Whereas if he's by himself, he's sometimes a little flat and sometimes a little sharp and much more variable in how he does it. Um, and whereas I can't hear the difference there, female birds are very, very sensitive to those changes. And it makes sense, right? The courtship song is the one that he's singing to impress that female and convince her that she wants to mate with him. So she should be able to detect the changes in song that he does in order to impress her. All right, and so we know that females can tell the difference between these songs because we've asked them. And in particular, if you ask them in a phonotaxis assay where they can move to a speaker playing one song or to a speaker playing the other song and you look to see where they spend most of their time, females that are um, responding to the, the songs of their mate will spend most of their time next to a speaker that's playing that courtship song. So they really like the courtship song. Once they figure out what each speaker does, they won't spend any time near the one playing the non-courtship song, that alone song. So, Maybe because these are mated females, they're responding to the song of their mate, maybe that's what's driving this preference, right? Maybe they know the songs really well, or they associate mating or courtship um, with a particular male with that courtship song, and that's why they're showing the preference. So we've also looked to see if you ask mated females that are responding to unfamiliar songs, ones they haven't heard before, from a male they've never interacted with, um, or females that have actually never interacted with a male since their tutor. So they grew up with their dad until they were 60 days, and then we sort of raised them with other females. They haven't interacted with any other males. If you ask those females to respond to unfamiliar songs, they still, by and large, prefer that courtship song. So it's not necessary for them to have interacted with a particular male to show this preference. They just like courtship song. So females prefer that courtship song, even if it's unfamiliar. Certainly experience helps, right? The mated females are, do a little bit better on this. They're a little bit stronger in their preference. But for the most part, it's still there regardless of the experience. So what we wanted to know is, well, do females need any auditory experience, any experience with song to show this preference, right? Is this one of those inherent biases? Maybe it's something about the structure of the inner ear or something else that just leads to this preference for the courtship song. So to investigate that, what we did was we altered the developmental experience of a number of female songbirds, so or zebra finches in this case. So during development, we either had females that were reared with both of their parents, so here's the little um, the offspring here in the nest, and she was reared with both her dad and her mom, so she gets to hear courtship song and non-courtship song and other sorts of vocalizations that they do. Or we had females that were reared just with their moms. So at about three or four days of age, we took out the dads. The mom has to rear them as a single parent. Um, and so the female will hear 
the calls and other vocalizations that her mom makes, but she won't hear any examples of learned adult song. Um, and so then we asked, can, do females that are reared in these two conditions, how do they compare in their song preferences? So we test them as adults. And in particular, we have a female, and she's next to a speaker. And, um, and she's in a sound box, a sound attenuating chamber by herself. And she's just sort of hanging out there, and she'll produce spontaneous vocalizations while she's just sort of sitting around and eating and so on. And then we'll play her song. And then we see how her behavior changes. So does she increase her calling in response to that song? Does she decrease her calling? Does it stay the same? And so on, with the idea that when they increase their calling, they're more interested in what we're playing to them. All right, so we did this, um, uh, we did this sort of experiment, and we tested females on the songs of 14 different males, on the courtship and alone songs of 14 different males. And um, this is the, uh, these are the responses of all of, the average responses for all of our females to all of those different songs. And this is for the normally reared birds. And so anything above zero is a preference for the courtship song, anything below zero is a preference for this alone song. And so the things I wanna point out are on average, so this is the mean for all of these points, on average they tend to prefer the courtship song, which we already knew. Um, they don't prefer it for all males, so there's a lot of variation in the strength of their preference depending on the male. In some cases, they really prefer the courtship song over the alone song. In some cases, they're sort of on the fence, and every once in a while, they won't have a strong preference for the courtship song, but they'll have a hint of one for that alone song. But on average, they seem to like the courtship song. If we look at those song-naive birds, the ones that were reared without getting to hear song during development, the pattern looks very different. So here in the light blue, these are all of the song naive birds. On average, they don't show that preference for the, the courtship song, and that's because they show sort of, sometimes they agree with the, uh, what the normal birds do, but in lots of cases, they show very different responses to those same songs. So it seems as though having that early auditory exposure, that early exposure to song, is really important for birds to be able to show this species-typical preference for the courtship song. All right. So the next thing we wanted to know was, are there parts of the brain that seem to contribute to this preference for the courtship song? So what we did was we took our normally reared birds, and we played them either the courtship song or the alone song, and we did the same thing with our song naive birds. Um, and then we assayed their brains to look at the expression of two different proteins. So one of them is an immediate early gene. These are uh, proteins that are activity dependent. So when you have a change in the firing patterns of neurons, you'll get increases in the expression of these proteins. Um, so we can use these throughout the forebrain and the auditory cortex to get a sense of which neurons are responding to the stimuli that we play. And then we can also look at um, the identities of particular types of cells. So the other protein we look at is shown here in green. It's tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in dopamine and norepinephrine production. So what this lets us do is to look um, for where we have red and green together, we can identify dopamine neurons or norepinephrine neurons that are responding to the particular stimuli. All right, so when we do that and we sort of look through the entirety of the brain trying to figure out um, how these different areas respond to song, we come upon two that show really interesting responses given the behavior that we know about. Um, one of them is an auditory region. It's sort of a secondary auditory cortex, um, which in the bird brain is back here next to the cerebellum, um, or it's sort of the very caudal part of the brain. And so here's the, it's called NCM. Um, and here's the response of normally reared birds uh, in terms of the number of, of EGR1 cells, it's an immediate early gene, um, in response to the alone song and the courtship song. And you can see that there's a much higher expression in this part of the auditory cortex in response to that courtship song versus the alone song. And this parallels the behavior that we see because those females have very strong preferences for courtship song. Our song naive birds don't show that same pattern. So in fact, they don't show much of a difference in the NCM um, to these two stimuli. And again, this parallels the behavior because we don't see that consistent preference for courtship song in our song naive birds. The other place that we saw a, this same sort of difference was in a neuromodulatory region, in particular in the ventral tegmental area, which is a dopamine producing region. 
And so what we see is the same sort of thing. Here we have increased expression in these dopamine neurons um, for the courtship song and less expression for the alone song for our normally reared birds. And we don't see that same pattern in the song naive birds. In anything, if anything, we see the opposite um, sort of pattern in the song naive. So we now have these sort of two brain regions that seem to be showing um, activity that's related to the sorts of behavioral differences that we see in our birds. All right. So that's a, a snapshot of the kinds of studies that we do to try to understand how development can influence um, female preference. So what about adult plasticity? Um, so we know that there's lots of plasticity in young animals, including young people. Um, what about plasticity as adults? So we come to this from this idea, um, there's an old adage, which is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And this is from back around, I don't know, the third century BC, I think. And I think its longevity speaks to how it resonates with humans. So from an academic perspective, um, we could think about things like music, and you could think about how there are some objectively great pieces of music, right? If you were to um, sort of poll a large population of people and to ask them what they think of particular pieces of music, some of those pieces will pull up above the noise, where everyone will agree that this is a fantastic piece of music. Um, and these days, with sort of digital music and uh, using machine learning, lots of people are actually trying to figure out what makes a great pop song, right? So if you go through and you put in your song and you, you analyze it with different algorithms, you can try to pick out what features of that song make it, make it so popular, make it objectively great, right? So we can come at this from this sort of dry and academic perspective. These are great songs. We can all agree these are great songs. But what that doesn't tell us is why it is that I myself personally might like something completely different and might even like something that is really not good. Um, <laughs> that I, I might have a range of musical tastes. Some of them are, are objectively good songs and some of them even I know they're not great songs, but I love them. Like they're, they're irresistible to me. They're my favorite songs. And so how do we get that disconnect, right? Where does that come from? That sort of experience-dependent individual variation that you have. That's the sort of adult plasticity that I'm thinking about. So yeah, so what kinds of experiences uh, lead to that individual variation and in how you might assess different, um, different songs or, or pieces of music or other pieces of art, other stimuli, et cetera. And so what we wanted to know is, well, is that also true for songbirds? Does experience shape what they think about particular songs? Can you sort of provide them with songs that maybe you kind of know aren't so good because lots of females agree those aren't great songs, but if you give them the right experience, will they actually come to like that song instead? And so in order to sort of investigate this, we've, got, we've done the following. So we know that we've known for a long time that females prefer the songs of a mate. So if you have um, a female and you play her her mate's courtship song or an unfamiliar courtship song, again, in a sort of phonotaxis assay where she can move around, um, she will tell you that she really likes the mate's song. That's her preferred stimulus. She'll spend most of her time next to a speaker that's playing the song of her mate. Um, but it turns out that that you have to pick the right pairs in order to do this experiment. And I discovered this when I first got to McGill and needed to set up a bird colony um, to do all of my experiments. And so we set up a number of arranged marriages, I would call them, where we took two birds, we put them together, and we'd see if they would mate. And sometimes they did, and they had kids, and we kept them along sort of breeding birds for our colony. And sometimes they didn't. And they would be in there for weeks or months. They would never have any kids. They would sit at the opposite ends of the cage. And we thought, oh, this is not working. And so we would divorce them and try again with a different pair. Now, one of my first graduate student came into this and said, we should figure out what's going on with these pairs that are consistently not doing well together. Is there a difference in the kinds of interactions that they have? And is that leading to the reason why we're not seeing this consistent preference for the mate song like we used to back um, in a lab that had lots of happy pairs that were breeding? And so what she did was she videotaped um, cages that had pairs of birds in them, and she would tape them on different days, and she would measure a whole range of different behaviors, seven different behaviors that they were showing, 
And then she, um, she looked to see how those behaviors relate to each other, as well as to the preference for the mate song using a principal components analysis. And so what she found, so here's the first, she found two principal components that um, explained most of the variation that we had. Um, so one is plotted here and two is plotted here. And here is what we're really trying to make sense of, which is this preference for the mate song. And the first thing that she found, which I was surprised by, is that it didn't have to do with how aggressive the pairs were. So if you had pairs where there was lots of pecking and retreating and they clearly just didn't get along, um, ver uh, so that's loading here on this principal component and clumping or sort of affiliation is over here on the left, these aren't actually related very much to that preference for the mate song. So it's not, females didn't dislike the song because the male was aggressive or they were just fighting all of the time. In fact, what explained that preference better was the degree of courtship interactions and affiliation that they had. So if a female was in a pair where the male did a lot of courtship singing, where they spent a lot of time clumping or sort of cuddled up next to each other, she had a very strong preference for her mate song. Whereas if the male spent most of his time in the corner singing to himself, she did not show a strong preference to the mate song. She actually preferred the song of a different male. So this indicates that females can learn to like the songs of their mates, they can learn to prefer them, but it very much depends on the kinds of interactions that those birds have. All right, so moving forward from this, um, it's led us to this hypothesis where we actually think that that process of mating, that, that physical interaction between birds um, and the affiliation that they show leads to an association between the activity of neurons in the midbrain, in the ventral tegmental area, and the mate song. So you get increased activity of ventral tegmental neurons in response to the mate song as a consequence of this interaction, uh, physical interaction between the birds. So we know from decades of work on mammals that dopamine is really important for things like incentive salience. So um, the reason that you move toward a stimulus that you like is that sort of changes in the dopamine system. And I've shown you already, at least a little bit, that hearing preferred songs can increase the activity of dopamine neurons in our birds. So they like courtship song, and we see increased activity of dopamine neurons in response to courtship song. You can actually play them songs of different males. So if they, you play them the song of a preferred male, we see more acti activity in the ventral tegmental area in response to the preferred song here in orange versus a non-preferred song and silence. Um, and that's not true in other parts of the brain. So if you look at other parts of the VTA or in other parts of the um, midbrain dopamine neurons, we don't see that same relationship. So it seems as though we have the sort of um, increase in activity in dopamine neurons, and um, we think that that's related to this change in preference or learning about the mate song. So the other reason that we think that this could be related is work by Xiaowen Bao, um, looking at how dopamine can affect the auditory system in rats. And so in particular, here we go. Um, so this is just to explain to you um, what Xiaowen Bao has looked at. So here's a picture of a human brain in this case. The auditory cortex is over here on the side. And the auditory cortex is tonotopically organized which means that, so at one end you have sort of low frequencies and they move up as you go along. So 500 hertz, 1,000, two kilohertz, four, eight, and 16. So you have this sort of nice organization of frequencies along in a gradient along the auditory cortex. That's true in humans and it's also true in rats. So here's a tiny little rat brain down here and this little rainbow is showing you the different sort of stripes of tonotopic organization in the auditory cortex where it goes from very um, low frequencies to much higher frequencies over here. So you have this nice tonotopic organization, and there's been a lot of work showing how development, as I described before, can really shape the organization of these tonotopic maps. What Xiaowen Bao found when he was working with Mike Mersnick is um, that you could actually, in adults, you could manipulate um, the representation of these different frequencies if you did the right stimulus with it. So in particular, what he did was, so here's an example of a normal rat where high frequencies are here and low frequencies are here and there's a nice gradient. Um, what he did was to pair dopamine um, with playback of an eight kilohertz tone. So he's just playing back a tone at a particular frequency and he's stimulating in the ventral tegmental area at the same time. 
And what he finds is that there's this expansion of 8 kilohertz representation in that tonotopic map. So if you add dopamine while just playing this tone, you can get changes or plasticity in the auditory cortex. It doesn't work as well if you just play the 8 kilohertz tone by itself. So if you just make the rat listen to an 8 kilohertz tone, you won't get this expansion, um, at least not in the short term. It might, over the course of weeks, you might get changes. But short term, you won't get these changes. But if you pair it with dopamine, you can get this enhanced plasticity. All right. So what we wondered then, if we think that dopamine is, is something that's being um, activated in the course of mating, and that's what's leading to this association between um, the mate song and the preference, can we actually use dopamine to manipulate preference by putting it into the auditory cortex? So my student, Helena Barr, this is work that's in preparation. Um, she asked this question using a string pull assay. So in this one, um, what the bird gets to do is you have a female in a, in a cage, and she has two strings. She pulls one string, she'll hear um, one male. And if she pulls the other string, she'll hear a song from a different male. And of course, we switch the contingencies to make sure that it's not just that she likes to pull the one on the left. Um, so we test females, and we see what they like. And they tell us, oh, I like the song from the blue male or the red male or whatever it is. And then the next day, we infuse into the auditory cortex either um, saline or a drug antagonist, and we pair that with playback of the preferred song. And then on a different day, we put in um, saline or an agonist, and we pair that with the less preferred song. So the idea is that we're doing basically what Xiaowen Bao did, where, where he played a 8 kilohertz tone and added dopamine, you got expansion. What we're asking is, can we get females to like something different by pairing dopamine in the auditory cortex with playback of something they told us before they don't like? Does that make sense? All right. And so then on day four, we test them again. This time there's no drugs on board. They're just, they're back in their cage and they're pulling their strings and they tell us which thing they liked. And so the first thing that we find, um, so what's plotted here is um, the change in preference between that first test that they do and the last test. So anything that's at zero means there's no change. If it's below the line, they actually prefer their, that what they preferred originally, they actually like it even more. So they've moved deeper into their original preference. If it's above zero, it means that they're, they've switched their preference. They now like the thing that they didn't like. So if we give them saline, we don't see much change. They sort of hover around zero. If anything, some of them sort of increase their preference for that preferred song. If we give them a general dopamine agonist into the auditory cortex, we can actually have females that will switch their preference. So they told us on day one that they like song A, and when we test them on day four, they now like song B. And that seems to be specific to dopamine. So if we do it with norepinephrine, we actually don't get a change. So it's a, it's a specifically dopamine uh, effect. It also seems to be specific to the dopamine D1 receptor. So we get really strong changes if we put in a D1 receptor agonist. Um, we can drive preference for the less preferred song. And we can actually block preference for the preferred song with the antagonist. Um, so we can diminish the preference for the preferred song if we put in the antagonist. All right, and that preference is actually reasonably long-lasting, so we can test them a week later, and they still show this reversed preference, so that's what's shown here in green. Um, and it seems to be time-dependent, so you have to actually do it um, uh, within 15 minutes of the song playback. So if you play back the song, and within 15 minutes you give them drug, they'll show a change in preference. That's what this accidental point was here. Um, but if you give them drug 30 minutes or more after playback, you won't see the switch. So it's not just that dopamine is enabling plasticity generally, and that's what's leading to it. It's the combination of the two together. All right. So what I've mentioned so far is this idea of developmental auditory experience, shaping perception and preference for vocalizations. And we think that social and mating experience may be acting through this dopamine system can shape the perception and preferences for vocalizations as well. 
And so the last piece that I want to talk about is the interaction between these two, right? It's not just that you develop and then you have no more experiences after that. Usually you go through development, you tune up an auditory system, and then you have additional experiences that come through. And so how do those things interact? How does your early developmental experience shape how plastic you are as an adult? And yeah, so it's that question there. And so this work is ongoing work by my current student, Erin Wall. And the, her setup is the following. So she takes, um, uh, she takes a sound box, that's this blue square, and she puts in a male and a female bird in a cage. And like the previous studies, these birds can physically interact. Um, the female will hear that male song and they can, yeah, they can pair bond. Um, and so these are our mated birds and that male will sing. In the same sound box, so the same sound attenuating chamber, we also put two other female birds. These are housed together in a different cage, but they're housed together with each other. Um, and, we, and these are unmated birds, because there's no males here. And we put an opaque barrier between them. So the idea is that the females in this second box, they can hear the sound, that, the songs that that male is producing, um, and they can interact with each other, so they can still be kind of social, but they don't get to interact with the male physically, and they don't get to see him. And so the question is, is just being familiar with a song, is that enough to give you a preference for something, or do you really need that physical and visual interaction for it to work? And we also do this in both of our normally reared birds as well as in the song naive birds to give us a sense of, so does developmental experience influence the way that these interactions go? All right, so the first thing that we did was just to look at those same pair bonding behaviors that Hannah Schublum had looked at for the previous uh, principal components analysis. And so we looked at courtship song and we get the following data for here. So what this is a plot of is week zero is when we first put the birds together. So they've never met before, we put them into the cage and we film them for two hours and see what happens. And so this is telling you the percent of their active time that they spent doing each of the behaviors that I'll tell you about. And so, and then in black are our normally reared birds and in blue are our song naive birds. And so there's two things I want you to take from this plot. One of them is that the black and the blue symbols are really close together. So the song naive birds and those mated females are doing very similar things. They're receiving similar amounts of courtship song, for example, um, across time. And then in addition, we see that there's changes in particular behaviors over time, and that's not surprising. As you move through different stages of this pair bonding, we'll see changes in the amounts of different behaviors. So initially in week zero, there's lots and lots and lots of courtship going on as the male is following the female around the cage and singing to her. By week one, there's much less of that, and it's also still low in week two. We also looked at clumping, which is when the two birds cuddle together either on the perch or in the food dish or in the nest. Here's an adorable pair right there. Um, and so we see that, again, the overall pattern is similar for the, the two developmental conditions. Maybe it's a little bit higher here for the song Naive Birds. Um, and clumping seems to increase in week two. So there's a lot of courtship that goes on early on. And once that courtship is completed, then we see a lot more sort of cuddling together of the birds. And then finally, we can look at nest building. So this is one where um, after they've established this pair bond, both of the birds will go off to um, build the nest together. And we see increases in nest building over the course of time. And it doesn't seem to differ between those normally reared birds and the song naive birds. So for the most part, we don't see much effect of development or developmental um, auditory experience on these different behaviors. And then the last thing we looked at just to make sure was how much sort of pecking and bill fencing and fighting we had. And generally that was low for all of the groups um, and it was the same for both the normally reared and the song naive. All right, so overall we see that we have very similar kinds of behavior, that not hearing song during development doesn't seem to prevent you from forming these sorts of pair bonds. And we can then test what those females think about different songs, uh, what their preferences are. And so when we do this for our normally reared birds, what we see is that the mated females um, tend to show a preference for their mate song, as we've seen this before. Um, so on average, they will pull strings more for the familiar mate song than for the unfamiliar song. The unmated females, it 
just listening passively to that song over time doesn't seem to affect their preference. So sometimes they like the familiar one, sometimes they like the unfamiliar one. Most of the time they're kind of on the fence. So just listening passively to another bird singing for two weeks isn't enough for them to show a preference for that song. It does seem like this physical interaction is important. Our song Naive Birds um, also show a consistent preference for the familiar song. So we've tested lots and lots of song Naive Birds in my, um, during my career, and they're, the one thing you can say about them is they're generally inconsistent. They will change their mind from one test to the next. They will change their mind relative to what another bird has done. It's hard to predict what they'll do. This one is the first example that we have of females consistently telling us that they like something, um, these song naive females. So this is actually um, quite striking, and it's very similar to what we see in those normally reared birds. When, again, when we play, um, when we test them on the, the unmated females on these songs, um, we see that they don't have a strong preference for one thing or the other. So again, that passive exposure doesn't make much difference. So we only see these effects in the mated females, and it doesn't seem to be affected by auditory experience. Now, one thing that hopefully you all have picked up on in this particular graph is the enormous size of these error bars that are over there. And that is actually a consequence of the, um, the way that we calculate what the, the way that we calculate this preference index. In particular, if birds don't pull the strings very much, we have difficulty um, putting confidence intervals on that. And so the confidence intervals actually get very big. And so that led us to want to look at what the, the raw values are for string pulls. And so shown here, um, rather than it being an index, what we're looking at is the average number of string pulls for familiar versus unfamiliar, for normally reared to mated and unmated. And so you can see, um, yeah, in this case, um, the mated females show pull the string more often for the familiar or the mate song versus the unfamiliar. We see that also with the song Naive Birds. For the unmated birds, they pull similar amounts of time for or a number of times for each of them. Our unmated song naive birds just don't pull strings. They're actually just much less motivated to hear song, which is, um, is surprising for these birds. So zebra finches are very gregarious. They, um, they like to spend time together, um, yeah, either with other males or other females, but generally with other birds. And so hearing song is actually something that's very rewarding to them. They like to pull strings if they're by themselves to listen to those songs, except if they're um, song naive. And so this is actually something we're going to look into more. Yeah. Hi, it's really interesting talk. Uh -huh. uh, my name is Pascal. Uh, I'm one of the students. I was wondering, like, compared to other stimulus, like the, um, the little dance or the, um, uh, the way the bird is presented, like uh -huh. uh, the, this, how important is the song uh, for uh, choosing, for discriminating a mate? Like, Right. So there hasn't been as much work on that as I think that there needs to be. But in general, females rely primarily on the song. Um, and so there have been a handful of studies where they have either um, switched out uh, yeah, the vocalization relative to the, what the visual stimulus looks like, and females pay more attention to the, to the song itself than they do to the visual part that goes with it. That said, if we look at a picture of a zebra finch, like he's got the stripes and the polka dots and the big cheeks, and he's brightly colored, like he's got all kinds of visual signals going on there. There's got to be something else to it. But for the most part, um, females do seem to, to attend more to the song part of it. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. I was just wondering, um, can the female um, gets bored of hearing uh, the familiar song too often, or is there a habituation effect where she doesn't react as much to the familiar song and she may switch to another uh, courtship song? Right, uh, sorry, so does the female habituate to the song of the male? Yeah. Is that the question? Um, and eventually does she get bored? So they don't seem to. So, so in general, zebra finches pair bond potentially for life, or at least for extended periods of time, not just for like a single summer. Um, and yeah, so in that respect, they don't seem to fully habituate to them. That said, there is some extra pair copulation that goes on. So 
I imagine that it's probably not as cut and dry as like they're fully monogamous and they're together forever. But, um, but females do really like the song of their mate and you can actually split them up and then test them years later and they will still respond to that particular song. So there is something about it that is kind of preventing habituation to some degree. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so I've talked to you today about this idea that developmental auditory experience is really important for tuning up the auditory system and the quality of that tuning, what you hear during development will really affect preferences. Um, in addition, adult females can also form these song pre preferences. They're also plastic, um, but it requires more than just passive exposure. Just They can probably remember songs that you play to them, but they won't show a preference for those without some additional stimulus. Um, and it, in particular, we think it might be dependent on dopamine that's in the auditory cortex um, or projecting to other places in the brain. And then finally, our song naive birds can learn to respond to their mate song just as normally reared females do. Um, and the context and social interactions may matter more to them than the song features. So one thing to pull together is that I told you at the beginning, those song naive females don't really care about courtship versus non-courtship song, but courtship and non-courtship song are really important for establishing that pair bond that courtship song is. And so it might be just experiencing courtship song in the context of courtship is enough for females to show that preference if they're song naive. All right, and so I've talked a bit, um, you'll hear more in other talks, I think, about the idea of the sort of um, inherent biases in perception, um, but I've talked a lot about sort of, yeah, how development and adult plasticity can really shape um, how you respond to sounds. And so the title that I gave this at the very beginning was, you know, what songs do female birds like and why do they like them, right? And one thing that I've really skirted around the entire time, but it's interesting to think about, is what does it mean to like a song, right? So when I think about, when I think about that Super Chunk album, I love that album, like I love those songs. And when I put it into my talk, I actually had to go play them because it was almost just irresistible. It's like, I love this song, I should listen to it now. And it's like that sort of Odysseus and the Siren song, right? Like you can't, you just can't avoid the incentive salience, the, the movement towards a particular stimulus. Um, at the same time, I know that my enjoyment of those songs is, it, it comes from a particular time, a particular event, a particular experience. I can put in memory and context to it. Um, in a, and I know that that's part of what feeds into my, my enjoyment of them. And one thing we don't know is, you know, the degree to which these other systems are also influencing female songbirds and their responses to song. So things like the hippocampus or other parts of the cortex, the auditory cortex, the prefrontal cortex, um, other cortical areas are all shaping the way that we perceive those sounds. We don't really have a good sense of the degree to which that's true for females. Does she just have, um, do females just have an increase in dopaminergic activity that drives them to, um, to respond to a particular song? Or are they actually remembering their mate when they're listening to it? And that's something we don't actually know yet, but good to think about. All right, so I want to thank, um, yeah, the members of my lab and John Sakata's lab. Um, these three ladies in the back were ones that contributed most to what I've talked about, Helena Barr, Nancy Chen, and uh, Aaron Wall. Um, yeah, and our birds and funding agencies. Thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, <clears throat> what does quality of tuning refers to in songbirds? When what does the quality of tuning refer to? Yeah. Um, so one thing that we don't know, so sorry, so neurons in the auditory cortex have spec responses to particular spectrotemporal features, right? So those neurons initially might respond to a broad range of things, and then as they get tuned, they'll respond to particular frequencies in particular time scales. And what we don't know is whether um, you actually need to experience particular spectrotemporal combinations in order to, for those neurons to have um, the proper tuning, to be responsive to not all frequencies, but to a particular combination of frequencies. Great, thank you. And I yeah. was also wondering, uh, how did you evaluate the quality of interaction between birds? 
was it by filming them? We did. So we filmed them and, and we basically just uh, counted the number of different events. So how many times did the male sing courtship song? How many times were they clumped together? How long were they clumped together? How many instances of pecking were there? That sort of thing. Great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Hi, my name is Simon. Uh, oh. All right, so my question is related to the very beginning of the of the presentation, actually. Uh, at the beginning, you said that female-directed songs by males are faster, longer, and stereotyped. Mm -hmm. And when you say stereotype, does that mean that males have some sort of baseline song across the species that is like a like, like a musical trend, let's say? Mm -hmm. So uh, by stereotyped, the, each male sings a slightly different song. So males learn their songs from their tutor, and then they produce sort of their own version of that, which will be almost exactly the same, but not quite. And when he sings by himself, um, the way that he sings that will have more variation in pitch across rendition. So when he sings it through the first time, he'll, he might hit A, and the second time he might hit A flat, and the third time it might be A sharp, and so on, for a particular part of that song. There's also more entropy within syllables when he sings by himself. So the noisiness of particular syllable, syllables is higher when he's singing alone. Does that help? Yeah, so it's, all, so it's always pretty similar. Is there some sort of evolution through time, through the generations of the song itself in a species? Um, some sort of, well, yeah. not say cultural, I don't, maybe there's so there is there groups. is cultural evolution. I'm trying to remember the details of those studies. So what's been interesting in zebra finches is there are um, some studies where if you initially train them with, I can't remember what they used as the first stimulus, but if you train them initially and then you let that propagate through generations, you'll if you train them with something very different from zebra finch song or with isolate song or something like that. So an unlearned version of song, they'll eventually progress back to producing um, what's sort of a normal looking zebra finch song. Um, so there is, and there is that sort of cultural progression that seems to happen. Okay, thanks. Yep. Hello. Um, are males having different versions of their song or different females? That is a great question, and we don't really know. So we've, um, to the degree that that our analyses pull it out, it doesn't seem like they are. But one of the challenges in analyzing song is that we tend to analyze the things that we can that we can see, right? And so, um, so for the most part, it doesn't seem like he's singing different versions for different females, but we're trying to come up with better analytics to, to really ask that question. So is his song to his mate different from the song that he might sing to an extra pair of female or something like that? It's a great question, but we don't really know. Okay, the other question is, how do you get the bird to pull on a string? Um, they actually do it, they do it naturally. So we give them, they like to build their nests out of material um, that's kind of string-like. So they'll either make strings of paper or they'll actually go out and search for grass or other things that are sort of long and string-shaped. And so we use the nesting material that we provide them in the lab, we use that as the strings and they, they gravitate towards it and pull it almost immediately. And they quickly figure out that if you pull it, it makes a sound because the song itself is very rewarding to them too. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Hello. So do the females ever have extra pair copulations? And if they do, do they look for males who have songs that are like their mates or different from their mates? That is a great question. So people always ask whether they have, they look for songs that are similar to their tutor, but nobody ever asks whether they're similar to their mates. And so I don't know. Um, it's a great question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michel Mercier. So earlier on, you, um, I, I might have missed something, so you could help clarify this so I understand better. Uh, so based on your one of your students' ideas, you found a correlation between the types of interactions that those uh, arranged marriage birds uh -huh. were having and the preference uh, of the females for the song. Right. right. For the female. So you, you were basically saying that, for example, if they you had this graph with mm -hmm. uh, different things that correlated or didn't. Yeah. Um, but what I didn't understand was how you inferred the correlation, the, 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 the causality, basically, because it seems to me as if if they don't get along, they, they won't interact. And so how do you 
say that one causes the other. No, it's true. And, and so we don't actually know the causality for that. Okay. So it's the case that in general, we have sort of, we have different pairs that showed different kinds of behaviors. And what we were trying to figure out was if we looked at all of them and we said, so, you know, how, given how much directed singing you do and how much clumping you do and how much pecking you do, um, how does that relate to what the preference is, right? But we can't say for sure whether when we put them together, the female was like, oh, that's a terrible song. I know I don't like you. And that was it, right? And so when we uh, videotaped them two weeks later, it was they had known immediately that they didn't like each other. And so that's why those things didn't go together. Or if it was the case that, um, that we put them together and the male decided that he didn't like her and that's why he's, he's singing by himself, we don't know what about their dynamic led to that difference. But we do know that in the pairs where the female strongly prefers her mate, we tended to see more courtship interactions, more clumping, and less undirected singing. Um, and it didn't seem to, to vary too much depending on whether they were pecking at each other the whole time. Okay, should yeah. I understand from this that at that point in the studies, mm -hmm. you were mostly trying to get good pairs? So right. That was the whole purpose of this, uh, mm -hmm. the main purpose of those uh, uh, analysis, analysis. Right. Oh, okay. Well, so the so our goal, we had done the arranged marriages, and we had found that lots of them weren't working out. And at mm -hmm. that point, we decided to videotape everyone um, that we had together and try to figure out, yeah, what the relationship was between um, between preference and. Um, yeah, and all of these other behaviors. So is there something that the pairs that are that are going on to have kids where we have a strong preference for the mate, is there something those parent pairs are doing that's different from the ones where um, the females like a different male than their mate? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if um, the birds like communi communicated uh, with each other besides uh, for mating. So do they have different songs to signal uh, different things uh, so, with each other? So our birds, um, our birds do. So they have these learned songs that the males learn from their tutor when they're young. And then they also have calls. And so calls are sort of these um, short, stacky, um, sort of um, flat harmonics with lots, or flat fundamentals with lots of harmonics uh, sounds that they make. And they have a whole a whole range of communication that they use with those. Some of those are learned and some of them are not. Um, but they there are different calls for when a bird is far away versus when they're close. There are different calls for um, birds that are like young nestlings will make different calls. There's a sort of range of communication that's there um, yeah, that birds also use to communicate. But the song itself seems to be a signal that's important for things like reproduction. Um, at least in our birds. Yeah. So, so when they're by themselves, usually they'll go for that song. So it's like if they would practice their mating songs kind of thing? Yeah, so so the current idea, and it it stems from the way that we think about the circuits that are, are driving song production and the changes in variability that we see in song. Um, people have come to think about the undirected or the alone song as being sort of a time for practice. So the basal ganglia, the other work that I do, looks at basal ganglia in males. And the idea is that the basal ganglia actively generates variability in the song. And so when the male's by himself, he's exploring his vocal space, um, even when he's already learned his song. So he's sort of figuring out which ways of singing work best for his current set of muscles and, and so on. Um, and then when he sings to a female, the basal ganglia quiets down and he sings the best version of his song that he can do. So we think of that alone time as being kind of practice. We're not entirely sure what its other function is, if it actually serves as an advertisement call to other, to females that are, you know, not his mates or might be farther away. We don't really know. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Hi, my name is Etienne. It was a mm -hmm. really uh, interesting presentation. Thanks. Um, has dopamine, dopamine influence incentive, uh, incentive salience and uh, prediction error factor mm -hmm. and stuff like that, who influence who are player an important role in associative learning? Um, considering considering it, do you think female like unpredicted variation in male song, huh. or if that's so, if female should prefer male who show flexibility in their song? Right. Uh, so. The short answer to that is I don't know. 
Um, I, it's an interesting question. What if if this variability is important, right? So if having more variability helps males to sing a better version of their song when the female is not there, then we might expect that if there's a bigger difference between directed and undirected song in the amount of variability, that that would lead to a stronger preference. Absolutely. And that's what we see. So it's the case that if males are, but it seems to be more a consequence of how variable the courtship song is. I'm not sure if I'm explaining this very well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, it, female preferences are stronger when there's um, a bigger difference in variability, but it seems to be less concerned with how variable the undirected song is and more concerned with how variable the directed song is, the courtship song. But within directed song, uh -huh. if there is unpredicted uh, change or flexibility, it should mm -hmm. increase the salience of this song and uh, raise the preference of the female for this male. I, 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 I think it could. Understand. I think in 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 this particular case, the females seem to show a preference, a bias towards the greater stereotypy. So if if males are really stereotyped, that seems to be something that they like. Although it is a it is. Um, It is an inverted U. So if it's too variable, they don't like it. If it's too stereotyped, it turns out they also don't like that because it it seems unnatural. And so there's some place right in the middle where it's got enough variability to be realistic, but not too much variability. And that's where their preferences seem to sit. We've got a bunch of experiments where we're, we're titrating how variable the songs are and trying to get a sense of where females sit on that. But having some variability does seem to be important. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Frederick. Um, I don't know if your colleague answered that question earlier this week, hmm. but um, I wonder uh, what happens when a young bird doesn't have a tutor to teach him the song. Mm -hmm. And in a, a possible space where there's a, there is many different grown grown male grown uh, possible tutors mm -hmm. um, do the males the young males uh, tend to show an a preference for a type of song they'll choose to imitate so um so if a young male doesn't have any song at all he produces a very aberrant version of song that normal females won't like Um, so it's, yeah, the syllables tend to be long and um, kind of warbly and so on. So it looks very different from a, a, an actual learned song. Um, if a male doesn't have a tutor but can sample from other males that are around him, um, he'll learn something. And it seems that males actually um, choose songs from tutors that are from males that interact with them more. So if the tutor feeds the, the juvenile, for example, the juvenile is more likely to learn that song than if he um, is just kind of passively listening to a bunch of songs that are happening around him. Does okay. that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Hi, Hi. my name is Mireille Goulet. Um, since um, the appearance of males is mostly driven by female preferences, mm -hmm. Have we looked into how the appearance of the male impacts the choice in, in uh, songs? Um, people have looked at it a bit. So there's a, a lot of work looking at how just visual cues by themselves influence female preference. There's a whole set of studies where it turned out that the color of the leg bands that researchers had put on the legs to identify different individuals dramatically influenced female preferences. They didn't like, I think it's green. Um, they, they didn't like males that had green bands. And so independent of any of the other plumage that males had. So there's been a lot of focus trying to figure out visual cues independently and song cues independently. And I think part of that is because both of those things are so complex and multimodal that until we really are, are multifaceted, that until we get a really good sense of like, what is it about the song that they're paying attention to, it becomes hard to manipulate them both simultaneously. But the hope is that at some point we will, yeah, get a better sense of, of how those two things interact. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Hi, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I want to know if you have any knowledge of what could, in the normal environment mm -hmm. of a songbird, um, 
create dopamine, like visual cues could create dopamine. Mm -hmm. It seems there is a, a, a link between uh, learned preferences and the production of dopamine, which would mm -hmm. explain uh, how, how could this happen in, in nature. What other cues could give this dopamine injection mm -hmm. so that preference could be developed in the natural world in the interaction with other sensory systems? Right, so I think there's all kinds of things in the natural world that could stimulate dopamine responses, right? And um, and we have no sense of, it goes back to this, we really don't have a good idea of what of those many visual cues males are, are signaling, which of those are actually important for, strongly important for preference. There's lots of focus on carotenoids and how orange different colors are, um, but it would be great to know, yeah, how those signals influence uh, dopamine activity and dopamine release. The male does this little dance. We call it a dance. It's That seems a little um, elaborate for what he does, but he'll basically sort of like hop back and forth. He'll change the shape of the feathers on his head and he'll fluff out his body a bit. Um, and he'll wipe his beak on the substrate or on his perch. And so he'll do that as he's sort of moving around the female. And, um, and all of those are visual cues that she can take in. And we have no idea whether any of those are stimulating the dopamine system or not, but it seems very possible that they could. Um, um, we know for sure that song definitely does seem to stimulate it. Even if it's unpreferred, we still get a sort of a bit of increase in um, the activity of those neurons, and then we get even more depending on how, how much the female likes it. Um, and that's sort of dependent on experience and just sort of dependent on whatever biases she might have going in. Um, great talk. I just had a question that you mentioned experience shapes preference that those birds raised only by their mom shows a less of a preference. Yeah, I was just curious, is it is it a true preference or is it that they're just worse at tell the difference between a lone song and a, a truly courtship song? So I think that's part of it. I think very much uh -huh. that um, that developmental experience of hearing song does shape how neurons in the primary and secondary auditory cortex are responding to these very fast spectral temporal changes in sound. And so it does seem as though that early experience is important for, for setting up the auditory system. Um, what's interesting is that our song naive birds, they still show preferences for things, they're just less consistent. And so we've been trying to figure out um, if they're not responding to the same features that normal birds are, what features are they responding to? And it seems quite likely that it has to do with a sort of aberrant functioning or an inability to discriminate the same things that the normal birds can. Hi. Hi. Um, my question is sort of related to the last question, mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering how you control for other effects that could be produced by changing the social environment of mm -hmm. the sung naive birds. Right. So uh, one of the things that I was um, worried about initially is that you can imagine that being raised by two parents versus being raised by a single parent might dramatically affect how much food you get and how much attention you get and, and so on. Um, there have been studies that have looked at um, changes in things like stress hormones and other hormones in birds that are reared with just a single parent versus with two, and they're actually not different. Um, so we don't think that it's that the effects that we're seeing are a consequence of a stress response that's due to the rearing condition versus is um, the elimination of song. But that's something that we, yeah, that we sort of need to work on some more. We've also had some females that are reared with two moms as opposed to just one. And in those cases, we see very similar responses um, to what we see with the ones that only have a single mom. Um, but it's a, it's a great question and it's something we're working on. Hi. Hi, I have two questions. One of them is really off in left field. Uh, <laughs> do you have any comments on the adaptive value of earworms? No. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no. <laughs> earworms are when a, uh, a tune gets stuck in your head and keeps coming back. Ah, interesting. Huh, I have never thought about the adaptive value of earworms. I was thinking especially of you and, and your, the songs that you like. Do right. They, do they come back and persecute you? Uh, they do once in a while, yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> And, and a, another off the, what, what is so, a vocal production like in females? So in our females, they, um, they produce these calls, these unlearned calls, but they don't produce song. Um, but it's, 
it turns out that zebra finches might be rare in that regard. So there's lots of species where only males sing and females don't, but um, there's thousands of species of songbird. It turns out there's a lot of species where both males and females sing. And, um, and so there's growing work on those species as well. And then you wonder whether they imitate the songs they like. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> else? Yep. So with um, Alex's talk yesterday, someone asked the question, um, what is it that justifies killing the voles in order to study their brains? And I thought that was a, a reasonable and fair question, and it arises here too, mm -hmm. doesn't it? What, what do you think justifies killing the birds in order to study their brains? So I think that there's a lot as far as, that's a, it's a tough question. Um, I think there's a lot as far as understanding how this sort of plasticity and how the brain works in a communication setting that birds can tell us something about, but very few other species can. And so, um, so if you think about male birds, um, there's very, very few animals that show vocal learning during development. So there's songbirds, there's maybe bats, um, there's elephants, there's cetaceans. And so a lot, of the, a lot of the animals, there's parrots and hummingbirds, a lot of the animals are sort of intractable to study. And if you're trying to understand how this sort of learning during development happens, songbirds are, are sort of one of the best models for investigating that. And it's important for communication and language are so critical for um, humans and there's a range of diseases and having deficits in communication can be um, hugely detrimental for the ability of, of people to interact with each other. So understanding how that plasticity works is actually quite important. Um, if you only study males, if you only study the signalers, you, you miss the whole other side to that, which is you know how, um, how do those signals get received and processed and what does that mean in terms of, of sort of how the brain functions. Hi, my name Hi. is Najet, and my question is, aside from the song preferences, what are the cognitive, if there are any cognitive um, consequences resulting from being raised with only one parent? That's a great question. I, we haven't actually tested them at all. So I think that um, there's been a handful of studies on um, zebra finches looking at cognition, but not very many of them. Um, and yeah, and so we don't actually, we don't actually know. Hi. Hi. Sarah, um, my question is actually kind of similar to that last one. Um, I'm thinking about the rearing environments that you used. And um, zebra finches are pretty biparental, and mm -hmm. dads do a lot of parental care, right? Yep. Um, and so I'm wondering to what extent the variation in the care that the chicks received led to some of the preferences. So not so much the not hearing the song, which obviously mm -hmm. was also absent, but just the quality of the care environment, because we know that that can have profound effects in all animals, humans, voles, and almost certainly in zebra finches. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. And so we don't, we only have a handful of cases where we at least had two birds that were doing the rearing as opposed to just one. Um, and in those instances, we don't see much difference between the two, but I don't know that we really have enough to say that the yeah, that there's no effective care environment. The other way that we can do it, which we've done with a handful of birds and might be our best bet going forward, is we can use Bengalese finches, like two female Bengalese finches, to because uh, they get along really well and like to do biparental care simultaneously. So we could sort of do that kind of thing as well. But it's, it's something that's on our radar, is figuring out to what degree it's a deficit in, yeah, in the social rearing environment versus just that they're missing song. Um, yeah, we also have a hint of a problem because we rear them in sound boxes versus in a colony setting. And so the question of like what other, they still hear lots of different sounds, but not nearly as much as if they were sort of out in the open and what kinds of contributions those sounds make too. <laughs> 
you're back. Oh, hi again. I have another question you may not have another answer to. Um, <laughs> but if the males are providing a lot of the parental care, are they doing any of the mate choice? And if so, might the females also be changing their calls to try and attract the males at the same time? That's interesting. So, so from my anecdotal experience, um, males seem to be uh, focused on a lot on plumage. So there are particular females that males will not court. Um, it depends on the male, though. So some males like a female with particular plumage, and some males like a female with different plumage, and so on. Um, and I think, like Elizabeth Atkins Regan did a lot looking at that kind of, um, yeah, that kind of mate choice in males in zebra finches. But it does seem to be very visual in many cases. We don't have a good sense of um, of how female vocalizations influence males. So we do know that if you just play males um, female calls, it doesn't increase their rate of singing. It also doesn't make them sing a courtship song. So they need the visual stimulus in order to switch into that courtship mode. Um, and so it's not, vocalizations by themselves are not sufficient for that. But it's very possible that there's some combination of um, the female's behavior and her plumage that lead to males being interested in them versus, yeah, a different bird. And we do think that there's at least some mate choice going on on the part of males, um, but maybe just not quite to the same degree that there is for females. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. My question is, um, well, in fact, I was wondering, because you take the birds and you make couples, mm -hmm. but um, did you try to take couples that were uh, mated like naturally? So you let the birds and then you see, oh, those two form a couple. So I'll take those two and make mm -hmm. my experience. So we've used, um, for most of these studies, we've put we've just put birds together, but we do use that approach to put birds together in our um, in our colony. And weirdly, I find it to be about as unpredictable. So if you put say five males and five females into a big aviary and you see who pairs up, um, it whether or not particular pairs form seems to be about as unpredictable as when you just sort of assign two birds to each other. Um, I think that there is. How do I describe this? I think that there's pretty strong preference by females for what they like versus what they don't like. But at the same time, when sort of paired with a particular male, there's a range of other dynamics that come into play. There's the sort of um, visual interactions and physical interactions and so on that can lead to them forming a pair, even if that male has a poor song. Um, and yeah, so but I think that question of, is there a difference between a arranged marriage couples versus couples where they've gotten the opportunity to choose that we don't know if those females have yeah different responses to particular songs Anybody else have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's a silly uh, technical question but i was wondering how did you um control or habituate your bird for the String pulling preference. How do we train them? Or yeah. so they actually really like to pull strings, and they really like to hear songs. So we used um, string material that they use for nesting, and so that meant that they would sort of uh, go over and investigate it pretty quickly. And the the switches are light enough that as soon as they kind of tug on it a little bit, the song will play back, and they quickly were able to figure out that association. It was much easier. We've tried it with other things. We've tried it with hopping on perches or pecking at something, and the string pulls have actually worked the best for us in terms of quickly making that association. So you did the training with the male song? Or we, because we actually, your first day was the preference test, and I would like to know if you control for the the, the length of the training with the song of the male. Right, so we actually initially train them with, um, we train them with calls at first, just so that they understand the sound string pull association. And then we usually train them on songs of a different male. So we'll train them, we'll get them trained up so they understand how the task works. And then for that dopamine experiment, we switch into, okay, here's, two new songs, you've never heard these before, tell me which, you know how it works, tell me which one you like. Thank yeah. you. Merci. Anyone else? Okay. Great. <laughs>